which way was the right way? Who's doing what they should? Open jump shots? Is it that simple? Some NFL draft all coming up next on tip off. Boom, 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 boom. Somebody said the drum set doesn't really match the way a real drum set would. Boom, 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 boom. He's absolutely right because I have drums here. Boom, boom, boom. I have drums here. Boom, 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 boom. And drums over here. And they're all at the same height. So you want some here and foot pedals, but you can't see the foot pedals. How are you? I got to close the door. Sorry. Got to let my little guy sleep. We have a broken arm in the house from yesterday. I'd like to thank Tyrone Corbin for letting us come back and being home because yesterday it turned out was a very important day for me to be home since my nine-year-old son, catapulting off the monkey bars, broke his arm, and ended up in surgery in the children's hospital yesterday. So uh, thanks to all the doctors and nurses who dealt with him, uh, to my wife for staying with him while I hung with our daughter. But anyway, uh, so that's that kind of sucked. Uh, probably means this will be a little short today because a little extra stuff to get done this morning. Uh, I spent a bunch of time. They'll be at 9 o'clock today. There'll be a post going up. Gosh, what what's the sequence of what I have here coming today? Uh, at 9 o'clock today, I've got a post that should be ready uh, on every offensive possession of the Spurs in the first quarter. Just trying to look what's going on. Uh, the second and third quarters might get ready, might not. Um, I dug into that Oklahoma City game for a little while. Um, that was a pretty awesome game. I'll tell you, I picked Dallas to win that series, and I actually feel like it's it's really where predictions are ridiculous. Um, exactly what I thought would happen in that series has happened, uh, except for Dirk missed an, a huge three. Uh, and a pretty decent look late in the game that I, I just never expect him to miss. Uh, you know, give Oklahoma City credit. They're, whole, they're, they're not making many mistakes. I, I might have thought that they had a mistake or two more in them under this pressure. And other than Durant, who I would say looks a little flustered, uh, I, they look good. I, I, I have a question on that one, by the way. Who wins the MVP first? Russell Westbrook or Kevin Durant? Who wins the MVP first, Russell Westbrook or Kevin Durant? By the end of this playoff series, in these playoffs, Russell Westbrook might be higher than the list. LeBron's going to win it this year. Rose has proved point guards can win it. I, I think Westbrook might be the guy. And, boy, is James Harden good. Oh, my goodness, is James Harden good. Uh, Jane, uh, if someone doesn't max out James Harden, uh, I, I don't know basketball. That's a max player. That guy's going to score 24 a game, going to line 10, 11 times. He's, he's great. I mean, he's really great. Uh, and, and it is clear that, uh, Dallas is just a few guys short this year. Uh, when Delon, when you're, I mean, last year you were relying on J.J. Brand to make some big plays and. I guess that's not that different than Delonte West, but uh, they Vince Carter. Uh, whoever thought there was going to be a game where you talked about Vince Carter as a defensive rebounder, defensive player and a rebounder. Never thought I'd see that. All right, to the Jazz. Um, boy, I did a lot of film study yesterday. Defending Parker is obviously vital. Uh, I watched as much as I could. Uh, he gets into the paint a great deal. Um, the big issue is, you know, once he got inside 10 feet, he killed us. When he was outside 10 feet, he wasn't great. Um, and the bigger issue to me is how what our bigs were doing. And what was interesting is our bigs were all doing different things. So Jefferson and Millsap, for the most part, and maybe this is what was designed. Um, I don't know what's right or wrong here. I'm just sharing the facts. Uh, Jefferson and Millsap uh, were zoning the area back so that trying to force Parker what seems to be into a jump shot before you get to the rim, but they were playing it so passively and so soft that that jump shot was a six-footer floater 
uh, seven foot floater instead of forcing it into a 10 or 12 foot jumper. I mean, it was really passive. Uh, I'll post, I've, I've saved some screenshots of Jefferson. I'll try to get that up. I'm trying to think if I get the other one up by nine, I'll try to have that other one up by 10 ish. Um, and then we fly it at two. So after a little while there, I'm done. Uh, and I got re parenting things to do here for a while today as well. Um, so I'm, I hope I get those done. Uh, so, you know, F Favors was coming out on the ball handler, shadowing him, not changing his route, though. So he'd run the pick and roll, and Favors would get on him and shadow him. Cantor would uh, really hedge all the way out and change the route. And then... Uh, Favors or Jefferson and Millsap would just hover in the middle of the lane. Um, and I think that's, I think that's interesting. I, I, what Jefferson was doing was not working. I'll say that it was incredibly passive. Uh, and that's got to change. And you know the fascinating one, I probably should. Uh, include this. You're seeing a post come together here. Is I if you read listen to the podcast I did yesterday with the players and the coaches about this. I I basically asked them two questions: um, How are we going to score offensively? Which everyone seemed to largely dismiss, and uh, I think is a major issue. That was the eleventh worst offensive performance the Jazz have had all year, and uh, I don't know how you. I don't know how, you know, and I, and the answer, Devin was the only one who kind of gave me an answer, which I thought was, was interesting. He said, you got to speed up transition. I'll discuss that in a second. This might be the essence of why the Spurs are so darn good. So uh, Al says, well, you got to play up. Well, Al didn't play up all the game. So I don't know if that's the adjustment or I, I really don't know. It was a little surprising to me that when I went back and re-listened to that podcast and listened to what the guy said after re-watching everything, that what Al said and what he was doing were two different things. Maybe that's Al understanding where he's wrong so, uh, or where what didn't work. Not he, I, I don't want to say he was wrong in any way, shape, or form. Our instinct is to be like, oh, Favors is great and Al's awful. But that's not fair because I don't know what the game plan was. Um, and might be better if I don't ever know because there's no need to point blame at this point. Just let's look at what happened. Um. So I, I think that's, um, you know, I think that's a, the big thing that I kind of took away from it. Uh, it's interesting where Ginobili wants his picks all high and uh, Parker wants his picks low. And boy, do they ever set them low. The other one I was working on last night, and I don't know if I can get this done in time, was all the different angles that Duncan sets his pick. I keep hearing the coaches and players talk about that, so I thought it would be interesting to see whether or not I could put that together for you so that you could see that. Uh, let me try to answer a bunch of the questions that I've been been getting from people. This is really a time where I should be answering more questions, uh, slash, uh, hashtag lock tip off. Um, and I haven't been doing that as much because there have been just so many issues. But a lot of my mentions uh, are clear. But again, remember to use the hashtag lock tip off and I will... Uh, I will get to some of those questions. People have not posted questions there for a while, and I don't blame you because I haven't been answering them. But for the next day or two, particularly tomorrow, when I have nothing new really to give you, uh, send those questions to hashtag lock tip off, and I'll go through them. Uh, one of the questions about the big lineup, the big lineup may not be as effective as it has been. It may be the best option still, but uh, Bonner is a Decent enough defensive player that for favors the favors Bonner matchup is tough. Um, I, I watched Bonner's threes on all the spot ups and faves. He actually does what he's supposed to do. It's just nearly impossible. I mean, there's a play where uh, Parker runs off a high pick and roll, or Neal runs off a high pick and roll with Splitter. Jefferson. This is probably the one time out far that the Jefferson kind of really shows a little harder. He's about 25 feet, so Splitter rolls to the basket. So then that's uh, favors man to come to him, and Neil throws the pass to the corner to Bonner. By the favors gets splitter tries to set a pick on favors. Favors does a pretty amazing job actually of rolling off the pick and getting out to the to the ball handler, but he's too late, and Bonner hits the three. 
Uh, both Millsap and Bonner sag, or favor sag in a little bit, but I generally think they're doing what they're supposed to do, and, and they still have a hard time getting out. That's just because the Spurs are that good. So, and then on the offensive end, Favors is not necessarily good enough yet in the post that he actually can beat Bonner. Bonner's a pretty decent position defensive player. Millsap has had a hard time beating Bonner this year when he was at the four, uh, though Millsap's not a great post-up player either. Um, and then Steven Jackson on Millsap, that's that. I, I'm not sure that the Jazz get the the mismatch that they've been able to get there because Steven Jackson's pretty big, and um, Steven Jackson is 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 not getting bullied around by at six eight two twenty. Uh, he he's not overwhelmed by Paul Millsap. Uh, Steven Jackson actually to me. Uh, to some extent, might be the example of why Paul can play this more often. Uh, You know, Paul's a 6'8", 253, so Paul's 30 pounds heavier. But again, Paul's not a great post-up player, and he doesn't really have a height advantage. He has a size advantage, so then Paul just has to change instinctually what he does. Uh, I still think the big lineup should be played because I think it's our best five on the floor, and it probably gives us our best chance. But it it does not have matchup advantages the way – uh, it has in some other matchups against the Spurs because they have so many different things they can do. And if they need to, they bring Boris Diaw in. And, uh, you know, they don't like to play Duncan and Splitter together. Splitter may not be able to go. And it'll be interesting to see how the Jazz deal with that. And Dwan Blair picks and rolls more than some of the other guys, and that caused the Jazz some problems. So th- they just have a lot of options. Uh, but when you look at that big line, you know, Truly, if you get into this game, starting Josh Howard and not going to the big lineup as soon as everybody wanted, while I understand while those were the areas of fan reaction, uh, have not probably been truthfully what uh, impacted the game. Uh, I'm not sure either of those coaching decisions had enormous impacts on the game. We had a hard time scoring, uh, and we just didn't. I understand what I think we were trying to do conceptually. You know, they're one, they're number one in the NBA on their roll man, on the pick and roll, and we took that away. Um, you actually look at what the defense did; it took away some thing. It did some things really darn well in that game, uh, and the Spurs were good enough to beat the Jazz in other manners. Um, the the one thought I have, and I I talked briefly to some people about this. The one thought I have would be to win this game that the Jazz almost have to win 84-82. Just sacrifice that can be able to score. But make it miserable for them to score also. So much of what they do is Tony Parker coming off picks at 18 on the shot clock. It, it, when you look at the first quarter play-by-play that I run through their offense sequences that I'll post later today, Look at how often that pick is set at 18 and 19 on the shot clock. Look, when you watch the game on Wednesday, two things to look at. Where Duncan sets the pick and the time on the shot clock. I mean, if you're watching with a DVR from Groove Satellite, a 208-9570, free plug. Just call Groove Satellite. Good friends. Good people. 208-9570. That's Groove. They do it for you. Get you the best deals in town, best customer service. They're amazing. It's Groove Satellite at 208-9570. How's that? Um, so you got your Groove Satellite D- Direct TV. Hit pause. I know your friends you're watching with will be like, that's annoying, but it'll be interesting, and then you can fast forward through the th- three-minute commercial break um, that is the NBA playoffs. Hit pause and see t- three things. Time on the clock where the pick is set on the shot clock. Where the pick is set by Duncan. And then if you really want to get X, E, and O, E, the level, the where that pick, how that pick is set. It's it's really incredibly impressive. Uh, few so keep an eye on those things. So my thought is just I wonder if you just muck this thing up. If the way you're going to beat these guys is make it 84, 82, insanely physical, um, slow game. You got to break their rhythm. You can't defend them if they're in a rhythm. If Parker's running free, getting it going. Uh, I think you got to throw some full court pressure on him every now and then. He'll probably blow by you, but you just have to break what they do. Uh, if they get into that early side pick and roll, they'll score at an alarming rate. 
Uh, and I, and I, I mean, I really think we're going to have a hard time scoring all series. So I, I believe let's concede that fact and just play physically ridiculous game. Uh, one of the other tip-off questions, I'm not sure I'm going to get to the draft stuff, was uh, when they isolated Duncan in the block on Jefferson, uh, why can't you have Favors guard him? Because you can't have Jefferson guard Bonner. He just can't go out on the floor 24 feet away. I mean, you might consider it, but I think it would be a disaster. Uh, you know, it might be worth trying it because it's worth trying stuff, but you're grasping at straws. All right, I quickly have got to get a few things to uh, sit. Uh, NFL draft. Uh, the, the, I talked about this the other day. The concept of the NFL draft uh, that everyone seems to miss is when, when you're drafting these players and everyone gets caught in draft position and all of that, like, it is do they compensate for poor play on your roster? Um, is the player better than the other player on your roster? Okay, those are the two questions. So when you're looking at Russell Wilson drafted by the Seahawks, which is a surprise pick, does he compensate for a poor player, and is he better than Matt Flynn and Travaris Jackson? Should be the only thing that's being asked. Uh, when you're looking at a Redskin pick like Kirk Cousins, it's insane. Because you already have Robert Griffin III, so it doesn't do either of those two things. When you're looking at the, the punter draft in the third round that everyone's talking about, that actually might make some sense. It makes you a lot better. It seems early, but it, it, it doesn't matter if it's early if it makes you better. Uh, the BYU lack of draft picks to me is alarming. Uh, the only thing I think it shows is how scheme-oriented the Bronco Mendenhall's coaching is, which is terrific. Uh, what a fabulous coach he is. But I do think it speaks to, uh, negatively, to the level of talent that's coming in that might be available uh, and the development of that talent. Because I would say some of these guys come thinking they're going to be NFL players. And, and that trend seems long. I have said this entire time that I think the work that Bronco Mendenhall is doing is unreal, that the environment and circumstances in which he's working on are so much more difficult than Lavelle with other schools uh, competing in the West Coast as well. When Lavelle first started, BYU was one of the few schools on the West Coast spending money trying to win. Uh, that He trying to, uh, you know, people didn't know how to recruit LDS kids. They do now. So everyone's out there and play. Uh, it's very, very difficult, and any one of these cracks in your frac in your foundation, uh, I think, are are painful to you because of how difficult the environment is. Um, I, I also just big picture, you, you really you're not an, you, not that they really have been, but the idea of national championship or things of that sort are insane uh, unless you have four or five or six NFL players on your roster. Uh, that's that's just history. He says that. Uh, so the idea that we keep talking about BCS and that level without NFL talent, I don't think is very realistic. Uh, two guys I want to give a shout out to uh, that maybe are non-traditional sports reporters. I mean, I love the NFL and I read a ton about it. And actually, this whole switch off radio has allowed me to do so much more NFL. And the tip off will do a lot of NFL uh, when it's time. Uh, two guys I think you should follow on Twitter are uh, SC underscore Doug Ferrer and uh, Greg Cosell. I think they're both terrific when it comes to the NFL. All right, just thought I'd throw those out there. Have a good one.